and original. From Story Studio Network. I'm Dave Trafford, and this is the 2030 Project. The 2030 Project is a Story Studio Network podcast sponsored by Daily Bread Food Bank, a Toronto-based charity whose mission is to collaborate with all to eliminate food insecurity and advocate for solutions to end poverty. After three years of consultations, legislative crafting, committee reviews, and political pushing and pulling in the House of Commons and in the Senate in Ottawa, the Canada Disability Benefit Act finally received royal assent on June the 21st, 2023. It's intended to raise those living with disabilities in Canada out of poverty. Can it? Will it? Well, we've already explored the question of eligibility. So in this episode, we're going to address the question and the definition of accessibility as it applies to the Canada Disability Benefit. And to help us navigate these questions, we're joined by a number of advocates and activists from across the country. They have lived experience. They've been on the front lines of the push to make the Canada Disability Benefit Act a reality. So without further ado, let's meet our guests. My name is Ron Anisic. I am a member of the ODSP Action Coalition, and I'm an ODSP recipient in Toronto. My name is Sarah Kennel. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the National Director of Public Policy with the Canadian Mental Health Association. Yep, my name is Jonathan Lai. I'm the Executive Director at Autism Alliance of Canada. I'm also an adjunct faculty member at the Dalhousie School of Public Health. We want to get into this conversation understanding that we are only dealing right now with a framework around the Canadian Disability Benefit Act, that there is much work to be done, and that's understood. We've already recorded three other episodes for this series. One was a more or less a 100,000-foot view of what it is we need to accomplish here. And then we got into more of a conversation around accessibility and what that means. And what's the number one thing in terms of accessibility? And um, that came down to a question of eligibility and the criteria around that. And that's where we want to take the discussion today. Um, Just before we do that, can we just go around the table? Maybe we'll start with you, Sarah. And just, I want to get a sense from you. I hesitate to use the word scorecard, but is there sort of an initial reaction to where we are with the Canadian Disability Benefit Act. And I realize there's a lot of work to be done, and I realize that there are a lot of questions around it. But where do you land on where we are in terms of its status? Good, bad, worried? Yeah, I think hopeful is one word that I'd um, associate with the passing of the legislation in June. I think, you know, from the, you know, mental health related disability community perspective, this has been a long time coming and and we're really proud to be standing in in, um, solidarity with other disability rights activists and communities that have been long advocating for this. Um, Questions from our side are many, as you would imagine, you know, until we have further clarity around what those regulations are going to look like and and what the minimum floor will look like from a benefit, like financial perspective. Um, We have a lot of questions. But I'd say one thing, you know, looking specifically at where we landed on the legislation is is that it's still um, unclear or, um, you know, suggests that clawbacks will be permitted under um, the benefits regulations, meaning that if folks are on provincial or territorial income assistance programs or private insurance, like disability claims, that it's possible that those benefits be clawed back and that um, the actual investment or um, that's being made by the federal government won't be as great as it could be. And that's a real um, concern for us. And then another concern that we're looking at is to what extent will diverse voices from the disability rights community community be positioned to actually meaningfully engage in the development of those regulations and then also inform the implementation and monitoring of the benefit over time. So really ensuring that they're in the driver's seat in terms of decision making moving forward. So one of the phrases that's been thrown around um, 
it's an important one, Ron, is that nothing about us without us. And to get to Sarah's point is that those with the lived experience, whether it's those who live with a disability or those who are on the front line of advocacy, uh, are going to be part of this conversation in terms of solidifying and shaping the ultimate regulation, understanding that I, I think it's a good thing that it's regulatory in as much as it could be a living, breathing thing. From your perspective with the ODSP experience, where do you land on that level of hope or optimism that, that Sarah's expressing? I, I'm, it's very complicated. I am somewhat hopeful. We've been watching the development of the bill and the committee hearings very, very, very closely. But my actual analysis is that the government actually so far has done nothing except for there are politicians working in Ottawa who have gained a lot of political mileage out of their mere desire to help lift disabled Canadians out of poverty. And, 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 uh, the reality is, is that they have yet to do anything that resembles that. I mean, it's great that they've stated their fairly clear intent to move this forward at some point, but as has been noted already, there's a complete lack of detail. We know nothing about eligibility amounts. We're just starting now to learn about what the regulatory process is going to be looking like. Um, but from the point of view of a disabled a disabled person, there's not um, not a lot to be like tremendously happy about yet, except for you know the the hope that there's something that's going to happen down the line. If you look at the government's priorities, from our point of view, helping lift disabled people out of poverty isn't really on the radar. They're spending a lot of time talking about it, but we've heard this before from this government in particular. They talk a good talk about uh, climate change while they're building pipelines, and they talk a lot about indigenous reconciliation while they're arresting our indigenous brothers and sisters for defending their land. So I, I don't know that you can put a lot of weight in what this current government says. Uh, I, I would also note that, you know, this has taken three years from the announcement to present day. And, you know, a lot's happened during that time. Um, you know, uh, when they made this promise, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine was two years away from happening. And those people seem to get our tax dollars a lot quicker than we than than disabled Canadians do. And that's to kill people. That seems to be the priority for this government from my perspective, and I'm fairly sure the perspective of a lot of disabled people. Jonathan, as I listen to, to, to Ron, um, and, and again, I hear a lot of people saying this is a good first start, but I fully appreciate his skepticism, and, and maybe it even gets into a degree of cynicism around it. And, and to some degree, as we watch it unfold, um, it's, it's warranted that, that skepticism, I think, no? Yeah. You know, we're hearing from the community, you know, there's always been a lot of consultation processes happening with the disability community. And it's a pattern in government to consult and try to, you know, hopefully have lived experience, have experts speak about it. But then what, how do you feed that into a process that allows things to move forward? You know, from our perspective, we've been part of this consultation trying to gather in our in the autistic community and other communities, disability communities, to, to bring forth what inclusive policy design looks like. So we have a good picture of what people are saying. You know, the reports have been issued by various organizations, you know, sponsored by government. But now what's next? How do what happens when, when we actually co-design these regulations? And then again, the clarity, you know, there's somebody has to make these decisions on the political level. Where's the political will? Um, and it's not one person, it's groups of people to move things forward in a cohesive way. Um, and especially, as Sarah brought up too, around, you know, that the clawbacks, the eligibility, there's so many different, different definitions of what 
who should receive this benefit compared to some of the other um, other supports that are, are are given at the provincial level, at the territory level, at the federal level. You know, how does this fit in? How does it um, complement um, some uh, some of these other supports? And, and trying to get a good understanding of that. That's where that's where the rubber meets the road, where it has impacts on people um, um, in their homes. Well, if we're not careful, rubber meets the road. People get run over if if we're not <laughs> pretty deliberate about the the direction that we're that we're taking. And I and I say that to be mildly facetious. You know, we're going to drill down specifically on the eligibility part of it, but part of that, and you've all touched on it, more or less comes down to an initial question of uh, definitions around criteria, definitions around. Uh, what is a disability in this country and how do we define that? And Jonathan, I, you know, there was a time I recall speaking to the advocates, advocacy groups in, in the autism space, and they would bristle at the idea that autism is a disability. Um, where are we with that language? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and that's, and you hit it on the head, the, this, the definition of disability has changed over the years. And depending on, you know, you ask 10 people on the street what a disability is, you're going to have 10 answers, right? And some of them might have some com, com, common elements, right? And, you know, you think about sort of the impairment model, the medical model, you know, it's an impairment in our body, in our brain, uh, what that means. Um, you think about sort of the functional side, oh, it's about activity. Oh, we can't do certain things that some other people might be able to do. There's sort of ecological models from the research. And then social models are saying, well, there's barriers based because of what's this, how society is built, both physically and socially, that kind of uh, uh, don't allow for full participation. And within the laws across this country in different provinces and in, in different even different departments, different legislation, you have various hints of different ways of thinking about disability. And that's part of the challenge we're having. So, you know, when you talk, going to your question, when you talk to an autistic person, it's thinking about, well, how do I think about my disability? Um, or do I think about it as a disability at all? Or is it a, more of an identity? Um, and some disabilities come up, come because of a label uh, that somebody else has given me or a condition, right? And so there's, there's so many different factors um, when we consider disability uh, in general. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge for us as a country um, to, to understand, especially with this benefit, who, who will it benefit and, and who's, who's part of that category. So and I'll just, just go back to the autism community for a second, though. And is there agreement within, that, in, in, within the autism community that autism should fall within that definition of broad disability? Yeah, so I won't be able to speak for every autistic, but I think generally people do see within the social model and under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, they would generally, uh, most autistic would say, yeah, I, I would I would fall in that camp, seeing that mm -hmm. there are sort of barriers to my participation in society based on what's happening. Um, some would realize that, you know, some would see their, their condition does have sort of concurrent medical uh, uh, issues as well. Um, that allow for, you know, the, the lens of disability to be applied. Well, and, and in most cases, when we start in this context talking about disability, Ron, we're talking about the ability to work. I mean, that's what it more or less comes down to. It, the disability is the, uh, the inability to, to, um, to work. That's why we need the benefit plan. That's why you need the ODSP. There's a, there's a support mechanism there that's required because of the inability to enter the workforce. And, and to some degree, the way the system's set up, you will know better than anybody, it stigmatizes those people who are taking the benefit. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking through a lot of what Jonathan just said. <laughs> Well, go ahead and comment. Yeah. When I think of disability, I think of, you know, part of the reason I'm drawn to socialism these days is because socialist political theory doesn't really recognize disability as a thing. It's assumed that everybody has different abilities and that's kind of built into political theory. Um, and when I, 
uh, I'm a dialysis patient. So when my kidneys failed, I had to sort of come to terms with what being uh, being a person with a disability meant. And I uh, honestly had a lot of struggles with with coming to terms with that. That was uh, that was a a huge thing for me. Um, Well, that's an identity issue, right? Yeah, I I still don't think of myself as as disabled. I mean, I mean there are a lot of things I can't do. I mean, if you're talking generally about ODSP recipients, I know that uh maybe 5 to 10% of us are able to work. Um and uh I don't know if you heard those comments that Doug Ford our premier made uh in front of the Empire Club a few weeks ago. He, hap- he said he's happy to take care of disabled people, but people in Ontario Works are healthy and they're just taking your money and we've got to put an end to that. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I know that 46% of ODSP applications are rejected. <laughs> and where are those people? Well, they're on Ontario Works. And on Ontario Works, you get $733 a month. Nobody is healthy who lives on $733 a month. That is just not possible. Um, this is part of the reason that the Canada Disability Benefit is so important. You know, honestly, people who, who, who uh, uh, people with disabilities in this country are, uh, especially the ones who are relying on social assistance from the provincial governments, are living in deep poverty thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars below the poverty line and and that's the reason that that you know we're the the part of me that has hope for the canada disability benefit it's less hope and more of a realization that this is a hundred percent necessary this is something that absolutely has to happen right so i don't know when i think about when i think about what is it disability anyway to come full circle i i i i don't know that i fully accepted that such a thing exists i think that Mm. this is a natural state for human beings and everybody has different abilities and that's just the way things are so to hear sarah to hear ron try to articulate that in a very personal way it makes it all the more difficult to think that we can come to a fuller understanding nationally of how one identifies disability in this country. Because, you know, here's a guy who doesn't think of himself as disabled, but requires the support of a disability program. Um, There's a real challenge here in terms of definitions and eligibility requirement. Yeah. I think a few thoughts are coming to mind. I think, you know, to both Ron and Jonathan's points around the imposition of labels and the stigma that comes with, um, you know, formal definitions that are meant to be broad in their application. I think um, erase a history um, that from a mental illness perspective involves the criminalization and targeting and institutionalization of people living with serious and persistent mental illness. And it's only through um, a relatively recent process of deinstitutionalization whereby, you know, quote unquote, asylums were closed, where we've had to grapple with um, a social safety net that's meant to um, not only respect, protect and promote people's human rights, but also um, really critically look at what full and equal participation in society means. And that's what the Accessible Canada Act sets in terms of a bar. We're moving away from not only, you know, functional tasks associated with daily living, but um, as you said, Dave, you know, the ability to work, but so much more, the ability to go to school, the ability to participate in community, the ability to live in a family, the ability to have social connections and, and what would find access to financial resources and economic security mean for that. And that's where I think we really need to um, look at the Canada disability from that lens is um, how do we ensure the benefit is unlocking access to those um, those things as well. Um, and, and, and just to add, you know, from a consultation perspective, um, you know, it, it was noted by 
Economic Social Development Canada that um, that people with mental illnesses and the mental illness community was not adequately consulted um, during the legislative um, development process. And so, you know, while this government may be really good at consulting and, and we, we are tired of engaging in consultation, there's there are absent voices from many consultations. And I think when we look at disability rights, it's that much more important to ensure the meaningful participation and adequate resourcing of diverse voices in these processes. And until we do that and we do it right and we hold ourselves to that commitment, we're not going to get this right. And that's a problem. Well, at the risk of being, you know, uh, as, as skeptical or on that, you know, verge of cynicism, much of the consultation, just from my own perspective, a guy who's sitting back and watching it, could be chalked up to see, being seen as busy work. It's, I don't know how much we're accomplishing in terms of that. And when I hear, you know, people like you, Sarah, tell me that after three years, this is a community that was still underrepresented in this conversation, it leads me to, you know, ask the question around, are we actually focused on only visible disabilities or are we really ignoring willfully or otherwise what amounts to an invisible disability? And I think in some cases, mental health issues fall into that category. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think we we have that experience um, and, and the research and the data to back that up. You know, when we look at the disability tax credit, for example, um, and we look at who is denied, who actually accesses that benefit and what the criteria is to access that benefit, it, it marginalizes and invisibilizes, particularly people um, with mental health related disabilities, among many other forms of disability. So not to say that you know, um, mental health is a unique experience within this, but just in terms of um, the application of that um, that credit and uh, and the ways in which um, we evaluate it, it's evaluated by the CRA. Are they experts in determining who should and shouldn't qualify? I don't think so. Um, and when we look at the criteria in that form, you know, doctors, nurse practitioners, and psychologists need to fill it out. Again, from a mental health perspective, the barriers to getting those um, forms completed by those types of medical practitioners who are not only trained, but, you know, are have enough um, capacity to evaluate this over a long period of time, um, given the mental health considerations it takes to, to fill out these forms, like there are barriers riddled within these processes and our concern is that those forms will be replicated into this new benefit and and there's a huge amount of risk with that so I, i'm hearing from other groups though and we talk about eligibility um that the the base here jonathan has to be that we have to take the a page out of each provincial and territorial program as it stands right now i learned yesterday New Brunswick doesn't even have a disability program, that there are additional benefits if you're, you know, on something that would represent um, social supports. But is that good enough? I mean, to say whatever the definitions are in these regions of the country, or should there be an effort in the next 18 months to say, this is the accepted understanding from Halifax to Victoria and up to, you know, none of it, how we define, first of all, disability and define eligibility around this program? Yeah, that's a really good question because, you know, quick review of like, if you look in, I'm, I'm looking at even the list of, in Alberta, you know, they have an act for you know, what they call uh, for insurance for severely handicapped act. That's what it's called. And, you know, it's an, a person's ability to earn a livelihood. Um, and it's has to, and likely to affect the person permanently. So that's a, their definition. If you look in BC, their disability assistance eligibility criteria, it's got to be a physical or mental impairment for over two years, has to restrict daily activities and requires assistance from a person or a device. So just even with those two provinces right beside each other, and I can read the other ones, you know, in Quebec and Ontario, every every place across this country is going to have a different definition. And I don't know if we'll ever harmonize a definition for every jurisdiction and even within the federal government, the DTC, you know, or other, or the disability tax credit and the, and the, um, the uh, benefit we're talking about now, but to realize that there are differences and there's a local 
and the reasons and the historic reasons for that. Um, and how do we say, okay, now in, if you live in this postal code, you get it. And now if I move to this postal code, I don't get it. Right. And, and I'm still a Canadian. So there's so many challenges with that. And I don't have the right answer to that. There's, there's sort of pros and cons to every way we decide. Say we follow a certain pro, a program, a provinces model, or you say based on the province you're residing in. Yeah, that's great. You know, it, it allows you to, you know, hopefully be able to stack that and, and not have clawbacks. But there are challenges. Say as a country, do we have a unified understanding? And, Will we be able to reach that? And I, I sincerely doubt it. Um, just even within uh, Sarah's example with the disability tax credit, it's a very different understanding. Looking at the intent of the policy to help with some of the disproportional challenges of having a disability or not being able to fully participate, you know, versus something like the medicalized um, tax credit, uh, where you have itemized receipts for every single piece um, that that sort of. Uh, um, you can actually get a receipt for, right? So it's mm-hmm. a very different way of understanding and has sort of different policy intentions. So it's it's very, you know, going back to the very, our opening, it's very unclear of what, what this is going to do and how it's going to do that, um, both yeah. geographically and functionally. As I hear Jonathan talk about this though, Ron, you know, one of the things that we haven't included in our definition of disability is poverty. Because if we listen to the whole idea that somehow the Canadian revenue agency is going to be an arbiter in terms of who gets some kind of tax credit that assumes that you are filing, you know, your taxes that, that, that at some level um, we're, we're in a place where you have an income that makes a difference to the government. That's not the case all the time. So there are places where it doesn't matter that, um, you know, you aren't eligible for that program because you live in poverty. So the poverty in and of itself that we're supposed to be trying to solve becomes a disability that isn't part of the label, part of the definition. It's absolutely essential that disability poverty gets addressed at some point. And it, it, as far as eligibility goes, I think that, you know, we don't have to establish a firm definition before we move forward on moving money out to Canadians. Like that is an ideal. That would be great if that happened, but I don't think that that's 100% necessary. I think the way to get things moving is to take the list of disability benefit recipients from all of the provinces and probably add recipients of the disability tax credit um, and have that be your starting point. Now, it's not going to be perfect, um, but that's going to cover the people who are probably, I imagine, in the worst financial shape currently. I mean, I I can't imagine anything worse than um, having to live on disability benefits. Well, I guess not having them there, you know, but, uh, you know, this is essential that we move this forward as quickly as possible. And what I keep coming back to is the time. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a long time we've been talking about this and, Again, it's a promise that's three years old and, you know, we're looking at maybe five years from the announcement before anything actually starts to happen. And that's taking a relatively optimistic view, I think. I mean, we've heard the government, uh, Minister Qualtro has kind of moved the goalposts on the timing a number of times just recently. I mean, we were saying a year now they're saying 18 months or two years. Um, I don't know. I don't think we're ever going to have the, the definition of disability that will please everyone. And that's to my point earlier is that this has to be an organic, living, breathing framework, I guess, Jonathan, because otherwise, you know, circumstances are going to evolve. Conditions are going to evolve. We're going to see where we... we I mean, just even in the course of this conversation, we've come to a better understanding of what, how mental health fits into this, how autism fits into this. And if 10 years ago, we wouldn't have been having that conversation in context of disability. So it has to be a living, breathing thing, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I want to jump into what Ron brought up, you know, the poverty piece and Dave, yes. And, you know, think about our Indigenous uh, friends, you know, who, who live uh, in Canada and amongst us. It's, you know, 
the the tax filing is very different there, you know, for and their understanding of disability is very different. There are, there's there's no and and Ron brought it up, you know, there's some places where in some languages there is no word for disability. So how do we how do we support and what does this benefit? How does it relate to those communities and ones who don't file taxes or file it in a very different way and don't see the relevance of tax filing? So there's just there's a lack of awareness and understanding of what this is and when we talk about those hard to reach communities because we just we aren't reaching out uh, in, in proper ways that are appropriate, right? Um, so there's there's a whole level sort of those intersectional issues that um, need to be addressed for sure. Sarah, when we talk in, in that terms, I mean, right now we're kind of all standing in a circle looking inwards as we have this conversation. To what degree is it maybe the, the way to break the, the log jam here is to turn that conversation outside the circle so that, you know, guys like me who I like to think I'm paying attention, I'm learning something every time I talk to somebody about this, where the inadequacies are where the the inefficiencies are, where we need to be doing better. You know, and I throw this number around all the time. People are going to get sick of hearing me say this, but Feed Ontario did some research in 2019 looking at food bank use and poverty in the province of Ontario alone. It costs us $33 billion annually in terms of lost hours of jobs, services, et cetera, that all go into support, and I put that in air quotes, poverty in this province so to turn that around and to say this is why you know we need to start talking um in a in a really robust and mature way about the definitions of of disability maybe disability is the wrong word to begin with i don't know because there we attach a certain mindset to that and that gets in the way of talking about the eligibility and the people who need that support for for stable housing health care etc Yeah, I think this issue connects in such a deep intersectional way to other like structural barriers that folks face. I mean, when we think of access to healthcare, our public healthcare system is so narrowly defined. Um, When you think of what what's needed to keep someone well, what's needed to keep someone out of crisis, out of hospital, Um, we know it takes housing. We know it takes food security. We know it takes income security. We know it takes social connection. And yet, Is that what you go to your doctor to find? Is that what you go to the emergency department when you're in a crisis to find? Absolutely not. And until we start to see those connections and the economic security piece as one of the quickest, most efficient levers to lift folks out of poverty and address some of those intersectional structural barriers that keep people in poverty, we're not asking ourselves the right question. And and there are other quick fixes the government can take, right? Talking about taxes, automatic tax filing. Why should we have to be in a position of privilege and have um, you know, to, to actively go and fill out very complicated government paperwork in order to get government benefits that we are entitled to? There's $1.7 billion that's lost every year in unclaimed government benefits because people just aren't filing their taxes. And we know why they aren't language related barriers, geographic barriers, connectivity issues, not to mention the ways in which those those things intersect with one another. Um, One billion dollars is what we spend every year on counseling and psychotherapy out of pocket because it's just not considered as part of our public universal healthcare system. These are things that from a capitalist perspective we're losing billions of dollars in lost productivity because people aren't able to work. And that's discriminatory. And the federal government, because of the charter, has an obligation to ensure that all people, regardless of what their postal code, regardless of what the province in which they live, has those equal opportunities and lives free from discrimination. So for me, the buck stops with the feds. Well, it does. And as you describe it, and I'm again, I'm kind of taking it down to the extreme. Maybe the best answer is we only really need two ministries. We need finance and health and just make sure everything kind of intersects there. And we have the money to pay for what it is. And we broaden the definition of a proper health care. It's been a, a robust conversation. Uh, and I expect that uh, I might want to catch up with the three of you six months from now just to see uh, where all of this lands. Sarah, Jonathan, Ron, thanks for being here. We really appreciate your insight and your time. 
The 2030 Project is a Story Studio Network podcast that we are proud to produce. It is sponsored by Daily Bread Food Bank. If you'd like to help eliminate poverty, start by sharing this podcast with your federal MP, your member of provincial parliament, your local municipal representatives, anyone you think needs to hear this message about the Canada Disability Benefit. And to learn more, visit dailybread.ca. Mike Trutler is our technical producer and audio editor here at Story Studio Network. And the 2030 Project is produced by the team at Daily Bread Food Bank. I'm Dave Trafford. Thanks for listening.